megesta is the uh, word for greatness, and of course the power is the old dunamis that we used with our magazine, you remember in Minneapolis days, dunamis, which is dynamite, which is power, effectual power, to bring about actual results. And so that's all enclosed in that saying there. It's uh, greatness of power beyond anything that we could imagine or could comprehend, and yet it is a power that affects results. And I don't know if you've ever really worked it out quietly in your own mind, the explanation of reality that, of course, we've been sharing now for years together. But it might be good to look again at how mighty is God's power in each one of us at this moment. And what a complex creation we are at this present moment. And what amazing power there is to bring us about as we are now and to put us in the position we're in now. And that requires you to just consider for a moment what the Bible indicates happened at the very beginning. That God, first of all, had his own son, Jesus. And at that very moment that he begot his own son out of his own heart and spirit, at that very moment he conceived that you and I and all men and women would come into existence. At that very moment, he conceived that. The very moment he conceived of Jesus as his only son, that same moment he conceived of Jesus being the great human being that we know as the human race. And inside him, he conceived of creating thousands and millions of beings that would be like his son. And you remember why he did that? Because he knew that if they were going to be like his son, they had to have the freedom of will that his son and he himself possessed. And he knew that the moment he gave that to them, that same moment they could turn on him and rebel against him completely and the whole thing could go apart. And so he made us all inside his son because he knew his son loved him and his son would hold on to him and would hold on to all the people that were made inside him and would hold on to them even as they were rebelling and even as they were walking their own way. Now, where it becomes quite difficult for us each to conceive is that God foresaw, therefore, everything that he conceived of in that moment. And I think you can see that that is reasonable. It is reasonable to believe that, of course, the infinite God conceived all of this and understood what would happen and foresaw all that would come about. I mean, it's inconceivable the opposite, which is that he made something that he didn't know what would happen to it, and he wasn't sure, and he waited to see. Well, then you'd have to say, then somebody else must be God who can control these things. But he himself, if he makes it all, he must understand fully all that he has created. And so he knew that Trisha's grandmother would come into existence, that her great-grandmother would come into existence, that her great-great on and on, centuries, centuries, centuries back to Adam. He foresaw all that would take place. Yes, he foresaw what your great-grandmother would decide when she was married. Yes, he foresaw what your great-great-great-grandfather would do when he heard the name of Jesus. He foresaw everything that would ever take place in any of the lives that have been lived and that will be lived in this world and indeed in this universe because we don't know what else is beyond this planet. But God conceived all those things and he lived through every one of them. In that millisecond 
We need to see that, you know. This isn't a human being we're talking about. We're not talking about someone with the even a Pentium II who is trying to work out the, pro, the permutations of what could happen. We're talking here of the infinite mind of God, the Creator, who was able in a millisecond to experience the blood of every Jewish child that was slaughtered in the camps, who was able to experience every pain that your father has felt, every little feeling that he has felt. It's very important for us to see our God. That's what, that's what the whole existence of Jesus shows us, that our God did not create something that he himself would not take responsibility for. He did not create something that he would not have to bear the consequences of. He is not like that. He is not a God who thinks, oh, I'll make a little man here and I'll see what he does. He is, that's not the God that we know through Jesus. This is a God who is touched by our infirmities. This is a God who weeps in his son when Lazarus dies. So God foresaw every little thing that has ever been done by any of us, by any of our forefathers, by anyone who ever lived in the earth. He foresaw also all the events and the consequences that would follow from those decisions. He foresaw the Hitlers and the Alexanders. He saw, foresaw the Neros as he foresaw the St. Teresa's. He foresaw the Melissefitches as he foresaw the Pope Paul's. And he foresaw what each of them would do, all the decisions they would make, all the things that would come about. He foresaw the roads, all the explorers, all the men who developed nations and countries for good and for ill. He foresaw all those. But as well as that, he experienced them all inside his son, Jesus. So the Savior, when he appeared to suffer in the Garden of Gethsemane or on the cross, was showing almost nothing of what he himself had endured as all these things took place. He endured every cancer, every disease, every death, there wasn't a little old lady in the city of Bombay that has died that he has not died with her. And he has borne all those things. And that is only a little of the power because the greater part of the power is that inside his son Jesus, he bore all those things and then his son through the faith and love that he had for his father and his closeness to his father, overcame all those, turned them all around so that the life that your grandfather, your great-grandfather, my great-grandfather lived, Christ lived, and he adjusted it to all the things that had happened. He worked it in to the plan that God had so that everything would come around the way our Father wanted it to come around. And then he planted all of that inside every human being that has ever lived. And then began the real work because he began to work with the free will of each person that has ever lived and with our free wills. And without offending those free wills or tramping them under his feet, he began to work all the mistakes and the errors that we make and that other people make. He began to work them according to the purposes of his own will so that he would bring about the life that could be accepted and could be worked into his plan in every human being. And so here we sit in a remarkable position, which is why I, I brought to you the instance of the old photograph. 
because we sit in this position where we have up to now seen the life that we have chosen to live and partly affected and modified by the life that Christ has lived for us. And now at this very moment, in this very second, we stand with the power of two lives within us. The power of the life that Christ bore in his own body on the tree and bore the destruction of by his own Father's power. And we live also with the life, the perfect life, that he planned to live in each one of us, and that is within us. And so it's a bit like the old trams that we had in Belfast, and probably like some of the, the trams that you've seen, or the trains that you've seen. It's really as if we're going down a track, and there are points, we call them, where the line switches. And we talk about switching the points onto the northern line or the left, the, or the southern line. And there are points again and again in our life. You might say every second there's a point. And there is Christ's perfect life that he has lived for us. And there is the modified life that he has to bear for us. And we can switch onto one or the other. Switch onto one or the other. That's the mighty power. That's the incredible power that is in each one of us. That God has put in each one of us. So that we don't actually have to do the thing. We simply have to switch to the way that Jesus has already lived for us. We simply have to choose. That's it. It's such a little thing. It's just a choosing. It's not at all having to face the consequences of our choice, strangely enough, or having to say, how are we going to bring this about if we do choose? No, all we have to do is choose, because the power to do these things is in Christ, and that power is within us. And so all of that is available to us each second of our lives. So in a sense, every time any of us draw back because we think, no, we cannot do it, we aren't even in reality when we say that. Because, of course, the whole thing has already been done by our Father. We are simply saying yes to what Jesus has planned to do in us from the very beginning, or we're saying yes to the modified life that he has had to live in order to bring all things according to the counsel of his Father's will. So it is overwhelming, you know, when you think of the immeasurable greatness of power that God has put in each one of us. And uh, you really don't help your faith much by this reflection, because our faith is built just by God's Word. But it can, in a way, uh, receive a little confirmation when you think of the decisions that you've made. And you think of the things that you've done. And there aren't too many of them that you look back on and think, Oh, I did that by the mighty exercise of my own strength and ability. You don't. Most of the things that you've achieved, you've just chosen it, and it's kind of come pretty naturally. It's just gone along. It's come about without any tremendous effort. There's been effort, uh, 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 often effort that wasn't needed, and effort of worry and anxiety. And uh, much of our effort, you, uh, I'm sure you'll admit, as I certainly can see, much of our effort has been wheel spinning and has been a lot of fuss and has not actually contributed to the result. And so I think we can see in our own lifetime that though we know a lot about effort, 
Yet we would say that most of the things that have come about in our lives that have been successful and pleasant and have been permanent have just come. They've just happened. That's it. They've just happened. So there is evidence, it seems to me, to our intellect and to our own reflection and analysis, there is evidence that there is a power that has actually brought all these things about. And all we're doing is saying yes to that way or no to that way. So we undoubtedly have our free will. But both ways are in fact already lived by Jesus, have been lived, and the, the power to do these things is already within us, is already available, it's already been done. So that's, I think, a little of what it means, the immeasurable greatness of God's power in us who believe. It's a power that has already seen everything, lived through everything, and then arranged two ways for every human being on earth to go every second of their lives. Uh, you can see yourself, of course, Satan's only weapon is to uh, paint the whole thing as a fearful enterprise and, uh, and to deceive us into thinking that somehow we have to do this ourselves. Somehow or other we have to bring this about by our own effort. That's the only, the only power he has to do that. But once we believe reality that God has in fact outlined the whole thing, then our life becomes a simple matter of choosing, and the power is there to do that. And that's why, you know, the, the verse runs, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it is God that worketh in you both to do and to will of his good pleasure. It is God who does. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are sorry for the self-importance that we show in this regard. We apologize to you, Lord, for the gross egotism that convinces us that we are the ones that bring these things about, or we are the ones that have to mightily withstand evil and promulgate good. <coughs> Lord, we see that our life is much easier than that. And that you, our Father, have foreseen all the contingent events and circumstances. You have foreseen all the choices and decisions. And yet, while respecting our free will and preserving it, <coughs> you have worked these things according to the counsel of your will. And you have borne the pain and the agony of all these choices and of all their effects on other human beings. So that you have preserved for us, still a free choice. You have miraculously, by your own power, created us in such a way that we still have a free and open choice that we make day by day and moment by moment. So, Lord, we realize again that all we do is switch the switch. All we do is flick the switch up or down. And accordingly, the mighty power flows. And the light or the heat comes. So Lord, we thank you that that is the life that you have given to us. And there is nothing that we cannot do that you want us to do. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, too, for the gentle and kindly 
intimations of immortality that you give us when you put into us certain intuitions and certain impressions of things that we think you want us to do. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for your kindly gentleness in allowing us to see a little of what you want to do and to have that little part of saying yes to it. So, Father, thank you for your, the immeasurable greatness of your power in us who believe. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore.